All right, I have here a book, The Local Church, by Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. We're going to go to page 37. Let me show you here. Page 37, down here. Christians forget that once you put up a building, you are anti-New Testament. Ruckman's words, not mine. There are no buildings in the New Testament. Once you do this, you are in the state area. And you needn't pretend that you are not, for you are. The words of Peter Ruckman, not me. And some of you people will get all upset at me. What do you think about Ruckman? Well, what about Ruckman? Like, you know, I'm going to somehow say, oh, yes, well, Dr. Ruckman told me that church buildings are okay, so I'm just going to throw out my King James Bible and I'm just going to listen to Peter Ruckman. All right. Um, Ruckman never taught that he was the standard. He always taught that this book is the standard. And that's why for years and years and years I've followed Dr. Ruckman's ministry and I've recommended him and I will continue to recommend him. I'm uh, not like uh, some of the baby Christians out there that would say, uh, well, you know, Ruckman is wrong here and here and here, so throw him all out. Um, when you study under the guy and you watch a lot of his stuff and everything else, you see the blessings that, that God has bestowed upon the man in terms of teaching the Bible. You realize that this guy is a very unique, very rare teacher of the Word of God. Uh, Dr. Ruckman is a phenomenal preacher and teacher. Um, and you don't throw a guy like that out. Uh, if he was not of God, there would have been a whole lot more errors that he would have come up with. Uh, it's just as simple as that. And I believe a lot of the problems in Ruckman's personal life, a lot of the problems with other things like that, was because he knowingly was disobeying the New Testament. And I'm going to show you some things in here today, and some of the brethren are probably going to be like, well, I don't see how I can be saved saying that stuff like that. Um, there are all sorts of areas that you can compromise in as a Christian, and when you do, God will just whip you and beat you, and you will have health problems, you will have financial problems, you will have marriage problems, you will have all kinds of problems. And we're going to see he knows about it, and he admits it. So I'm going to show you a couple things here in this book. First, we're going to start out on page 31. Okay, talking about things here, he says, Finding a building will be the problem. Wendell Zimmerman uh, patched up a garage to found the Kansas City Baptist Temple. Show me some scripture for calling a thing a Baptist temple. Art Martin used his basement for three years before setting up the Bible Baptist Church in Canton, Ohio. Wayne Mund used his living room for a church for a while. All right. But why not continue it? We're going to see why you don't continue meeting in your home. We're going to see why. Next page, page 32. When you come in town, you will have to meet in your home for a while. You intend to start a Bible-believing Baptist church. Uh, there are no Baptist churches in the New Testament. Hmm. Show them from the Bible the difference between a Bible-believing Baptist and a multiple version apostate Baptist. How about showing them from the Bible uh, there is no such thing as a church building? In dealing with the closed church situation, get the building open, get the place cleaned up, try to scrape together enough money to make the grounds look half decent. Why? And, you know, I showed in my house church video, you know, starting a house church based on the King James Bible, um, a lot of these church buildings, small ones, will run up to half a million dollars. If you want to buy them out, right? I know that there's one in the town of Monticello, which is south of where we're at right now, here in Maine. And uh, the thing, I forget what it is, but it's an old Methodist church building. And the property tax, I mean, the thing doesn't even have any land. Property tax is next to nothing up here in this part of the state. But uh, property tax is like a couple thousand dollars for the thing. Unless you're 501c3, then you don't have to pay property tax. Because the government owns your land. Government owns your building. And that's, that's the truth, too, by the way. I'm not just making that up. <clears throat> Page 37. We'll read the other part of this here. Be careful when buying property to obtain a clear title deed to the land. Okay. Check this out. Failure to incorporate under law. I recommend that you file as a non-profit corporation under state laws so that your people can get tax credit for donations. 
Uh, I bet you Ruckman is regretting that one now, now that he's with the Lord. Uh, I bet you he wishes that he hadn't written that. All right. You're supposed to go to the state for the right to exist because your people have a right to write off their taxes or write off their uh, giving, excuse me, their giving, their donations on their taxes. Huh? I mean, show me that one in the New Testament. You know, Christians going to the government and saying, now, this is what I gave to the ministry of Paul. So you don't charge me as much tax now because I gave to Paul. And by the way, a little uh, interesting tidbit of information. Uh, this was in Peter Kershaw's uh, work uh, on the 501c3 system, uh, the hush money thing. He talked about that when you are writing off your giving, your uh, tithing and whatever else, when you write that off on your taxes, you actually are inviting litigation from the IRS because they see, hey, where's this all this money going here? Because, see, criminal organizations often do that. They'll, they'll funnel money into other organizations and kind of hide it over there and stuff like that and say it's a, it's a tax-free foundation and stuff like this. And so the IRS goes, what's this all about? So you are actually inviting an audit by writing off your giving on your taxes. I wonder why Ruckman didn't mention that in this book. Pretty sick. Down here he says, the modern movement is to not file for corporate papers and yet still claim tax exemption for donations. It can't be done. Uh, well, it wasn't done before, it wasn't done, excuse me, until 1963, when the IRS 501c3 codes were put into the, the law books by Lyndon Baines Johnson. Churches uh, were tax exempt for, you know, hundreds of years, a couple hundred years there. You know, if you want to go back to the Revolutionary War, I guess it'd be just under 200 years. Weird. Freedom of religion for almost 200 years, and now all of a sudden, oh, you have to go to the government to, to be tax exempt. No, the church, according to the Constitution, Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's the law. Oh, but 501c3 says, no, you're not supposed to say anything that affects public good or you're not to tell people who to vote for or things like this. Wait a second, I thought Congress wasn't supposed to make any laws prohibiting the exercise of religion or the free exercise thereof or whatever. Establishment of religion or the free exercise thereof. I thought they weren't supposed to, to make any laws. And yet they did with 501c3. So by you going 501c3, you are disobeying the Constitution. The Bill of Rights. Kind of weird, isn't it? Again, there's the quote. Christians forget that once you are you put up a building, you are anti-New Testament. Right there. What do you mean? What do you do with that? There are no buildings in the New Testament. Once you do this, you are in the state area and you needn't pretend that you are not, for you are. Right there it is. In Dr. Ruckman's own words. Check this one out. You say, well, why would he do it? Why would he do it? I don't understand. Why would Dr. Ruckman do a thing like that? If he knew it was wrong, if he knew it's not in the New Testament, why would he do it? This one might shock you. Page 39. You are in the eyes of the community a paid professional. Kind of a weird thing. They need a corporate testimony in the town so they cannot rightly be labeled as individual nuts. Excuse me? So people, lost people in the community can rightly label you as a Christian a individual nut if you're not part of a church building? So in other words, the motivation for having a church building then is so that you don't look weird to the lost world. Conformity. Isn't that odd? I mean, isn't that kind of a weird thing that a guy like Peter Ruckman would be worried about what the lost world thinks of him? What do you do with that? I find that to be very offensive. I can't tell you how many times I've been out in public and people say, oh, what do you do for a living? I say, well, I'm a preacher. I'm in video ministry. And they go, oh, where do you go to church at? And I say, we worship at home, just like the New Testament says. And they go, oh, Okay, well, it's nice talking to you. And they go away. 
doesn't bother me because I know I'm doing it the biblical way. I know I'm going to answer to God someday. I'm going to have to stand before the Lord. And, and, and if the Lord says, hey, you were an individual knight, I'll say, I was following your book. What am I supposed to do? Hey, if I'm wrong for not having a church building, I'm going to stand before the Lord someday. And he says, hey, why didn't you have a church building? And I'll say, you didn't tell me to do it. It's your fault. Isn't that weird? And I remember years and years ago I was preaching and actually a graduate of PBI told me, he said, he said, we need to get you in a church someplace where people can hear you and not in just this house church thing. Why? So people could start to emulate me? And they have done that, by the way, in church buildings. When I've preached in church buildings, I get people emulating me, coming up, oh, brother, that was a great sermon. Oh, it's a create a little cult of personality. But let's continue. Check this one out. Number three here. All of their giving should be tax exempt. They are entitled to it. There's a big problem here in America. It's called the entitlement mentality. I deserve things. I'm owed things. You know, I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to get too many blessings from the Lord if you're going to go to the state to get Benefits, kickbacks. Lord, I offer you, I offer you my money, Lord. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give till tax return. Then I get it back. I would ever love and trust Him until the IRS gives me tax return money. I surrender all till tax time. I surrender all till the IRS gives me my money back. That's called sarcasm if you don't understand, okay? I'm so sorry if you're offended. Uh, I'll be sorry. I, no, actually it's gone. No, I'm not sorry. Okay. Um, page 56, he, he goes into this whole thing here, uh, page 54 starts uh, talking about these guys with good works, brother. He bought 10 acres of land and floated a 120,000 bond program, $120,000 bond program. He rose to 790 with about 348 being bust in. He now averages about 500 a week. Uh, uh, there's another guy I met in a home. He completely reconditioned furnished the warehouse for 15000 went right up to about 725000 in Sunday school. Um, wound up buying 20 acres of land and is now running 500 in Sunday school. It works, baby. Bring him in, boy. Buchan Vic was not even ordained. Hugh Pyle never went to any college or institute. What's the point? They managed to raise $100,000 to set up a building. In his fourth year, this brother was running 723 in Sunday school. After raising another 170000 and paying off a brand new auditorium, Brother Singleton said, next to my Bible, I studied my financial statement the most. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing according to Dr. Ruckman. Oh, where's this at in the New Testament again? I don't remember where the verse is that they're running so many in Sunday school. Well, that's right. Sunday school's not in the Bible either. Now, if you don't find that offensive, uh, you better check your relationship with the Lord. Oh, he's saying that anybody who's ever gone to a church building is not saved. Well, then I'd be condemning myself. I've gone to him. No, what I'm saying is there's a lot of very miserable Christians out there that live very miserable lives before the Lord, and they're struggling with all kinds of problems because God's whipping them. When I say check your relationship, I'm saying if it's in the book, then you do it. If it's not in the book, then you start to question it. And you start to say, hey, wait a second here. And again, somebody's going to say, well, like you're on YouTube. That's not exactly in the Bible. Uh, yeah, but you know what? I don't call YouTube the house of God. I don't try to make YouTube a holy place. I mean, there's no uh, uh, traffic lights in the New Testament. And yet I've street preached at traffic lights different times in the past. But uh, let's continue. 
Um, I'm not going to read all this stuff here. Rudy Holland running over is running 600 to 700 in Sunday school with a weekly offering over 3,200, about 9,000 now. Why even put that in there? You know, here's a guy knelt on 11 and a half acres of property and prayed for it and sold 50,000 worth of bonds for a building, about 150,000 now. 250 present at his dedication was running over 600 to the third year. Running, running, money, money, getting things in. Supposing that gain is godliness from such withdrawal thyself. I have. Um, Brother Sal in Toledo runs over 600 in Sunday school. Brother Paisley in Seattle runs well over 1,000. And Rick DeMichael there, Boise, Idaho, runs over 800. In our next lesson, we will take up the matter of buildings and how to finance them. And here we go again. You understand that you are not under a New Testament setup in these matters. Therefore, one must proceed with the utmost caution. It does mean double caution and double prayer, double alertness and double care. Nice little rhyme there, Ruckman. But uh, again, we're not under the New Testament here, so we have to be very careful. Why not abandon it? Why not say, hey, instead of us raising $100,000 to buy some stupid building and then put it under secular federal government control, maybe we could raise $100,000 to buy Bibles and give them to people or to get more missionaries sent out or whatever. But you got to run those big numbers, man. Got to get the money. Lesson 7, church finances and church buildings. Not in the New Testament. Ruckman's own words. But we got to get them. Uh, page 60. The people will demand air conditioning and heating. A plan will have to include these. They will need drinking fountains, coat racks, uh, storage rooms, a choir room, a baptistry, and a dressing room, public address systems, yard lighting, parking lots, and acoustical padding. You or someone will need an office and probably offices. It is not like building a country Methodist or Baptist church back in the 19th century. Americans are spoiled rotten. They will not attend a place that is humid or damp or too warm or too cool. So then the thing that draws people in is not the Holy Spirit of God, but rather your building. I do hope it's comfortable enough. The last uh, Baptist Babel building I attended in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, well, I shouldn't say Pennsylvania, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. I uh, was in uh, Lincoln, outside of Ephrata, Liberty Baptist Church. Uh, they had raised $15,000 to put in new carpet because the old carpet was turning away visitors because it was ugly. It had a couple spots where it was a little bit thin. So, you know, the, they could barely afford to keep the lights on anymore and they could had to shut down the heat and the fire alarm system was broken and there were huge potholes in the parking lot. But we got new carpet. <laughs> yeah, down the page a little bit further here, it says, if you do get pews, make sure they are padded at least on the bottom. Americans are spoiled rotten, even the saved ones. building is what brings them in. Here you have page 64. You have the uh, Greek Parthenon, the amphitheater, not Parthenon, excuse me, the Greek amphitheater with the orator standing up there. Look up the pictures. I mean, it's insane. This is how you're supposed to design your church building. Here we have page 68. In building a new building, the general rule is the new building should be at about twice the size of the old building. You can get too optimistic and overbuild. <laughs> okay. Got to build that building, man. And when you rebuild, when you outgrow your first building, make sure you build it twice as big. So you can end up like J. Frank Norris' is one building there in Detroit. That's now a home for rats. And, uh, you know, professing Christians paid for that stupid building, and now the thing's abandoned, fallen down. What an incredible waste of money. 
page 75. And check this out, this one out. Do not be afraid to press your people for money in emergencies or where a real need has to be met in the church. Um, I thought the Bible said, not of necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. But you're to press them. When you got those big bills to pay, because you got to keep your government corporation open, you got to get you got to lie to the people and tell them they owe you ten percent of their income. Somebody sent me a, a link to one of Sam Gipps' uh, fairly recent sermons, and it's just so vexing. I, you know, some of Sam Gipps' stuff is a real blessing. Other stuff is extremely vexing to me. And I, you know, I haven't. I'm not gonna. I'm trying not to come out and just blast the guy. It just. <sighs> It's it's so difficult sometimes, you know. It, you know, you're just supposed to just keep overlooking everything, you know. And I'm just like, but he's a, he's at this Catholic cult building, and he's like, you know, you you need to give God your ten percent, and then after that is when you really start to give. God gets your ten percent, and then after that is when you're giving, when you'll be re rewarded for it. Ten percent, there's no reward for it. That's just required. I mean, that's not anywhere in the New Testament. It's a total lie. But I guarantee you what's going on there. The hireling at the little Baptist temple is saying, Brother Gip, we're having a hard time. We're barely keeping the lights on. Okay, we'll have to preach on it. And so he follows Dr. Ruckman's advice right there. Pump the people for more money if you have a need. It's disgusting. Here Ruckman actually quotes Jack Hiles right there. Jack Hiles, one of the biggest scam artists, you know. I mean, you know, I, I have in the introduction to my video series on Jack Hiles, I mean, the guy was a fornicating, just lying, false, you know, preacher. I mean, he got ugh, disgusting. But he, he said in the beginning, he's like, you know, at one time he's preaching and he's like, you know, I just bought a school. I just bought a whole city block. I just bought this. I just, I don't know why I bought it, but I just wanted to buy it, you know. Big, 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 big money. And the next he's doing this little advertisement for their school, the Hiles Anderson school there. And he's like, all we do is just barely pay the bills. <laughs> a scammer. But uh, here we have page 85. Someone must open and lock the building you meet in if this is necessary. You will need a sort of purchasing agent for furniture, sound equipment, insurance, etc., you have to have those insurance policies. And again, my experience from the past. Uh, the pastor of Liberty Baptist Church when I was going there, Guy Mosebrook, um, he had a insurance policy, a $1 million insurance policy that they had taken out on him in case somebody went there and they heard the wrong thing or something like this. You know, and then they get offended and they get, you know, like if he'd, he'd be preaching against sin and somebody go home and commit suicide because of what they heard and the family tries to sue him, then they have a $1 million insurance policy. That's in the New Testament someplace. I'm just not sure where. Page 88. Many a would-be do-it-all has driven himself crazy or into, into ulcerated insides trying to run everything in the church. And that's true. That's true. A lot of these guys, they'll just run themselves rampant trying to take care of this big stinking building. Those big buildings are a tremendous waste of your time, your money, your energy. I mean, it's just, but we got to continue it, brother, because we're, it's just, it's what we've done now for just a few hundred years. And so we got to do it this way. We can't give it up. We can't go back to the Bible. We can't do things like they did in the Bible because, you know, it, it, it's just wrong or something. And here he's making, saying about youth directors, the proper kind of youth director. Uh, none of this long-haired, bearded, lace-collar, tight-pants, Corvair stuff. Huh? And I saw that a lot from Ruckman, you know. Well, bearded and all this other stuff. And you say you're taking offense because you have a beard? Yes, I am. Uh, you see, I'm a, I'm a man. That's why I have a beard. And I find it interesting that Ruckman teaches that in the resurrection, we're going to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And yet he'll draw pictures a lot of times of Jesus with his arms around saints and the saints don't have beards like Jesus does. But I thought we're conformed to his image. But you have to be a clean cut 
clean-shaven Baptist. Well, if you're into unscriptural church traditions, yes. Uh, page 90, trustees. Heating, lighting, keep, upkeep of the building or ground, salaries, donations, purchase of equipment, janitorial services. That's what these guys are supposed to do. Government rules and regulations. I trust these men as a finance committee and they are given are there to give advice to me and the congregation on any matters that deal with government rules and regulations. They're 501c3. Talking about church secretary here, starts out, she doesn't have much of an office, but when you get big, she will have a very elaborate setup. I'll let you come to your own conclusions there. Because, I mean, Jack Howells definitely had a... I'm not saying Ruckman was cheating on his secretary or something like that. I think Ruckman's secretary is actually Brian Donovan's wife. So I'm not saying that there was anything going on there. Don't get excited. But uh, there was with Jack Hiles. Jenny Nishik was his church secretary. And uh, they had a little secret door between Hiles' office and her office. And there was frequent traffic back and forth, if you know what I mean. Page 103. This has caused more than one marriage to uh, bust up. I cannot remember one year our school has been open that someone's wife didn't throw in the towel and quit. And again, a lot of this, you know, in church, every time the doors are open, you got to get to the seminary, you got to do this, you got to do that, you know, and, and all this other stuff. Uh, it ends up wrecking marriages. It puts too much strain on the marriage. You're, you're always having to, to spend money to keep the stupid building going and you always got to be there and it's like, I don't have time to be with my wife because, you know, you got to be there all the time. Page 110. File every sermon and add illustrations to it when you preach it again. Um, the only time I've ever re-preached an older sermon is when I lose the audio or when the older one just messed up or something like that. I don't re-preach my sermons over and over again. But a lot of these guys, these Baptists, man, they just go around and they just preach the same stuff just over and over and over and over again. So, uh, okay, page 118. There will be all kinds of problems like roofs that leak, rooms that do not heat up, furniture that gets moved in the wrong place, class records and enrollments to be kept, records of visitors to be kept, and so forth. Again, how much of this stuff is even necessary if you're meeting in homes or meeting out in the woods or meeting out in the fields like they did in the New Testament? And again, you know, you go into this thing here. Um, I'm not going to read all this stuff here. But the little uh, games that can be played in Sunday school to get Sunday school atten attendance up. Gimmicks for raising Sunday school attendance. You know, Sunday school's not even in the New Testament. You know, I like this one here. There's the bonehead club where your men have to wear a tie pin with a skull and crossbones on it until they bring a new member or an absentee to Sunday school. That's the right motivation, you know, right there. But, uh, you know, it goes down through here. Talks about uh, one church platform. They brought in an elephant for the kitties. Unfortunately, he decided decided to relieve himself about then. I have not figured out to this day if that was an accident or Lord showing what he thought of the whole godless mess. Well, I'd go with option number two there. Page 121. Passing out candy and toys to the smaller children in daily vacation Bible school and like meetings is proper, but I would not take it beyond the 12-year-old level. Don't get into the guess which of our buses has a $5 bill taped under the front seat business. Don't go overboard in the giveaway business. Business. I thought it was supposed to be a New Testament church. Oh, that's right. It's a anti-New Testament, but do it anyhow. So, I don't know if there's anything else. Yeah, just write, or just show you this one here. Uh, lesson number 13, The Joys of the Ministry. When I came to Bob Jones University in the fall of 1949, I bought, brought a wife and daughter into a 24-foot plywood trailer that was about eight years old. It had no bathroom, no running hot water, and no refrigerator. We hauled ice by the block to put in the ice box. In the winter, icicles formed inside the windows, and I had to stuff them with ice, or excuse me, with rags. 
We used a community bathroom. Two more children were born while we lived in this trailer. My income was $30 a week from the GI Bill. I received no financial help from my parents, although my wife's people occasionally helped us out. We lived this way for five years. I bought my first car in 1950 after walking for 27 years. I had not enrolled in BJU to learn the book, and it's a good thing that I did not. I would have received a massive, massive shock. It's very true. I went there because my mother-in-law, Mom May, had recommended the place as a clean place. She had sent two of her sons and one of her daughters there, and none of them had stayed. <laughs> I got the lay of land real quickly, and in so doing, probably messed up my own life for another 12 years. And he did. He did. But why recommend it to other people to do it? And I remember seeing Ruckman in one of his sermons. I'm not going to try to find it and put the clip in and all this other stuff. But uh, I remember seeing him in one of his sermons. And he said, you know, he said, when I hit the judgment seat of Christ, I wonder how many rewards I'm actually going to get. Why? Well, because the majority of his ministry, this stuff up here, I believe he's going to be rewarded for. This kind of stuff, his Bible teaching and preaching and things, defending the King James Bible, you won't find anybody that's better at that teaching the Word of God, and I mean, just a variety of subjects. Praise the Lord for Dr. Ruckman on those issues. But in practice, what he did with his church building was completely unscriptural, and he knew it. Yet he persisted in it. I just want to show one thing here, another thing really quickly, this one here called The God Called Preacher, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. Again, in, in line with the whole... Uh, perversion thing. He says here, the last time I was propositioned by a teenage girl was in Waco, Texas during a revival meeting. The proposition was clear cut. I was 72 years old at the time. A teenage girl offering sex basically to a 72 year old man. Uh, there's no perversion in these things. Oh, it's perversion all the time. And again, you can pretend, to, oh well, the, the house church is the same and all this other stuff. Please, oh please, I don't believe that for one minute, okay? Absolutely ridiculous. So, uh, if you're a, a fan of Dr. Ruckman, um, you need to understand that at least he was honest, unlike a lot of you out there, you know, that are saying, there's, you know, nothing and blah, 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 blah. Oh, the church buildings are fine, they're, they're okay, God's used them, blah, blah. Hey, Dr. Ruckman in his own words said it's anti-New Testament. What are you going to do with that? You better get right with God, okay? I had to make those decisions. I had to, to come out of the whole Babel building situation and just simply say, you know what? I don't care what people say about me. I don't care if they label me as a cult leader or cult member or whatever else. I don't care. I'm going to do things God's way. If God wanted us to have church buildings, he'd have put it in his book. Just plain and simple. Not that hard to figure that out. So that's going to be it. I really do pray that you'll take heed to what I'm saying here. Take heed to my words. Ruckman knows better now. Uh, I don't, I'm not saying that the guy's lost or he's some kind of a wicked, terrible man. You know, I'll show you a little picture here on the back. You know, um, He would have been far more effective if he wouldn't have had that right there. Give that thing up, brethren. Uh, there's no scripture for it. And all that these things are, they just are magnets for trouble. And they have trouble down there all the time. I know people that go there. I know people that have gone there, attended the institute, everything. I know people. There's problems down there all the time. It's just strife and contention. You say, well, there's been good times too. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, there's been good times. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but it's not scriptural. It's anti-New Testament. Get away from it.